It's time for Supply Chain Now Radio, broadcasting live from the supply chain capital of the country, Atlanta, Georgia. Supply Chain Now Radio spotlights the best in all things supply chain, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and the critical issues of the day. And now, here are your hosts. Hey, good afternoon. Scott Luton back with you here live on Supply Chain Now. Welcome back to the show. We're broadcasting live today from Modex, the largest supply chain trade show in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, it's, been, uh, it's being held right here in Atlanta, GA, the supply chain city. Uh, and we've got a really interesting episode here as we're going to be interviewing an innovative business leader and entrepreneur. And stay tuned as we look to increase your, your supply chain entrepreneurial IQ on this there episode. You go. <laughs> Say that Doubling down. 17 times at, <laughs> at 422 on a Monday afternoon. On a quick programming <laughs> note, though, uh, you can find our podcast wherever you get your podcast from. We invite you to subscribe so you don't miss a single thing. Let's welcome in my fearless co host here on today's show, Greg White, serial supply chain tech entrepreneur, trusted advisor, supply chain adjutant. And a recently crowned Atlanta City Tennis Champion. Greg, how you doing? I'm doing great. <laughs> you didn't bring that your... is quite the intro. That's <laughs> as if that wasn't enough, and gosh, don't you think it ought to be. <laughs> you didn't bring your, your, your uh, golden plate. I did not. No, I didn't. But I if, you'd be hanging if you it follow me the... on Twitter, you can see it. Okay. <laughs> and one of my less adult moments. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Greg, we've got a great conversation teed up here today. I'm, I'm so glad we're able to kind of uh, fit this one in. I know Phoenix Innovations team stays really yeah. busy. They've had a lot of interest here at Modex. And we've got their founder and CEO, Amit Mahajan, with us. Yeah. Amit, how you doing? Hey, good. How are you, Scott? Doing fantastic. I'm so glad we could fit you in. Uh, I, I, I saw as you were visiting our section yep. of this supply chain world, a lot of folks wanted to get a little bit of your time, it looked like. Yeah, good to be here. I mean, there's a lot of activity going on over here. Um, not as much as we want it to be, yeah. but, you know, hopefully tomorrow is going to be better. That's right. Yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's a tough, like we've talked about, and yep. a lot of conversations, a lot of episodes already, including the lead-up to it. It's a tough time for many, including yes. those in, in the trade show and, and certainly in supply chain. Uh, but I like your optimism. <laughs> well put. Yeah. <laughs> New news every day, and every well, day is a chance for good news. That's right. As an entrepreneur, you have to be optimist. True. Yes. If there's anything else, you have to be optimistic. Yeah. You know? so. yeah, that's true. So I think that, that kinda, that's kind of set the tone for this interview. I, it it kind of yeah. is my sense. So, uh, well, he must be really, really optimistic because wait till you hear how many entrepreneurial <laughs> ventures he's got. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so on that note, let's get yeah. to know Amit a little bit better. So yeah. before we start talking shop and, and f- before we talk about Phoenix Innovations and what that team does, Let's get to know you a little better. So tell yeah. us, where were you born and raised? And give us a, a, an anecdote or two about your, your upbringing. Sure. So if you have not guessed by my accent of, at this point, I was born in India. Okay. I was born in um, a city uh, close to Mumbai called Pune. Okay. okay. And yeah. uh, um, I grew up in Mumbai, um, did my engineering over there, um, went to UK for a bit, did some research over there. And then came to United States. So what part of the UK? Um, I was in London, and I was in Ipswich. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. I worked for BT Labs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Great. so I'm a telco all all my um, years of experience. Uh, worked over there. Came to US. Worked with MCI, and then uh, it didn't work out. So, for whatever reason, <laughs> a MCI. lot of people kind of went Kansas sideways. City? No, I was not. Thank oh, God okay. for that. Right. Yeah. So I was in Atlanta. Okay. And um, a part of the mass markets group. Uh, and then uh, worked for a telco called Alltel Communications. Yeah, of course. Which is in town. Um, from there on, I went to uh, Singular Wireless. I was one of the early members at Those Singular. Those were the days. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. It's like we, we were conquering the world back yeah. then, right? <laughs> yes. We Indeed. actually, I mean, believe it or not, we actually went in and bought AT&T Wireless. I, I remember that. And yeah, because it went ATT, yes. then singular, and then, and then back, back ATT. Again, mm, yeah. yeah, so we thought we'd won the World Cup, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you won the golden plate. If we won the golden plate, yeah, there you go. In yeah. the day, I worked for Southwestern Bell Mobile Systems when really? the, they split the cell companies away yes. from the, yeah, from yeah, the telcos. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we go through this cycle in telco yeah. of uh, divestitures and, and consolidations, yep. right? 
So I, I think we're getting close to a divestiture cycle very soon as well because mm. uh, with the consolidation of um, T-Mobile and Sprint, yep. now there's only three big ones left. And so I think uh, at some point in time, it will start getting split up again. Mm. Mm. Um, plus, and I think, you know, it, over a period of time, uh, people in these large companies feel stifled and they want to go out and they want to innovate. They don't want to be bound by the rules and regulations. And Sounds like somebody speaking their life story. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. So, before we talk Phoenix so, Innovations. So, before we ask you what inspired you yes. to become an entrepreneur, I have a feeling you just told us. Yeah, I think so. You know, yeah, you're right. <laughs> well, we're gonna, I'm going to back up before we, we go forward, as okay. it were. Because you, you shared a little tidbit right before we went live about your passion for motorcycles. Yeah. Yes. So share a little bit about, because that, that's a, as we look into humanize who we're, we're interviewing, tell us more about that. So I love motorcycles. I've been riding since I was a kid uh, in India, and uh, I came to the United States. The speed scared me a bit, <laughs> but then I got used to it. You know, I, you know after a while, you, you're like, okay, you're going to do it. Yeah. That's it, you know? So... <laughs> Um, I had to work really hard to convince my wife. Mm. So in a moment of weakness, she actually agreed mm. to let me buy a motorcycle, you know. So you know how it works in our household. So <laughs> <laughs> or every household in the well, United yeah. States, right? So, um, But then, uh, yeah, I, I bought a Kawasaki Ninja back in 2001 mm. and uh, rode it for many number of years and then um, I didn't for a while. And then 2016... Um, I sold my last venture and I was toying on an idea of buying something nice, mm. um, the horsey kind, you know, yeah. so, yeah. yeah, so, but it was too expensive. Mm. So we said, um, <laughs> let's donate some money to the charity and buy and some get a motorcycle two wheels instead. instead yeah, of exactly. Yeah. Two instead of the four. Yes. More fun. The, <laughs> yeah. The Ferrari of motorcycles. Right? It is a Ferrari of motorcycles. Yeah. Exactly. That's so what's exactly the what fastest you ever been on a motorcycle? On um, a track, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think we right. should talk about Good track. Good job. Yeah. 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 Thank you. I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> right. So um, the fastest I've been is 145 miles an hour. Okay. All right. Good yeah, deal. So you can't make too many mistakes at that point. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or corners. Yeah. Yeah. Make too no many corners, corners, nothing. I mean, it was a straight, you go. And that's it. Yeah. You and you know you start downshifting very quickly. Mm. <laughs> so, <laughs> All right. So you can't break either. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, right. So. That's right. I think we could have the motorcycling hour easily here. Oh uh, yeah. But between me and Greg, I think we got a number of years on the bike. Yeah, yeah. we've <laughs> got a few, <laughs> few between us. Uh, but let, let's. So I want to talk about Phoenix Innovations. Uh, yeah. yeah. We did, a little, you know, of course, pre-show homework. Uh, up, you know, really up to some intriguing things. What does the company do first? So Phoenix Innovations works in the area of reverse logistics. The common problem that companies face in reverse logistics is when they bring the product back in uh, into their channels, into the reverse channels, they really don't know how to value it and how to dispose of it. Mm. So there is a significant intrinsic value that's left in product. So take, for instance, these sunglasses. Mm -hmm. Okay, These are made by Oakley, real nice. Um, high value item, right? Probably two hundred fifty, three hundred dollar item. Um, if you were to buy this thing on Oakley.com and then return it back again, what would Oakley do with this? So mm. the process would be, it would go back into the channels. They'd probably take off these rubber inserts, you know, clean up the glasses, put new inserts in because you don't want to be having the same ones. Sanitize the glasses, and then more than likely repackage it and sell it as a used item, mm. right? Mm. In some cases, for a number of years, people didn't do that. They would just take that, put it all into a box, and just auction it off for mm. no pennies on the dollar. So, literally, I mean, these glasses, you probably 15 years ago, you would have bought it for five bucks in an auction, you know? Or they would go into a landfill because they don't mm. want to be creating a gray market right, and devalue their, their top line brand product, right? So, they would crush it or go into the landfill. So, over the years, the industry has matured, the supply chain industry has matured, and they've realized there's a lot of value in this, and it's environmentally friendly to put these back into circulation, mm. uh, maybe not in the same markets, maybe in the rest of the world. So mm -hmm. take, for instance, smartphones. A smartphone has second, third, maybe even a fourth life, Right. you know? Yep. And we don't realize, but 
a smartphone iPhone 6 today in the United States, nobody wants it. But if you go to Southeast Asia, mm-hmm. somewhere Philippines, Thailand, Africa, Africa, yeah. yeah. People would love to get mm, it. Yeah. You know, I mean, that it still sells. Yeah. So, um, so looking at that problem and uh, having been in the telco world for these many years, we saw this as a niche problem and we started to solve this. So we built a product. Our product is called Midas. Um, like, like the Midas the King touch. Midas. Yeah. yeah, exactly. The, the Midas touch. It touches into the gold, right? So we extract maximum value from the return product. And we define and identify the amount of investment you need to make into that product to revive it and to bring it to a value. And then imagine this. Imagine if you are getting 50,000 returns every month on phones. Mm. Okay. How would you know which ones to invest money in and which ones not to invest money in? Right. It becomes a people issue. It becomes a process issue. Well, we said... Rather than that, let's make your system issue. Mm. And we solved it in the system. So it's we've got an AI machine learning system which keeps on learning. It gathers information from all around the world, values the product, figures out for that specific phone mm. what should be the investment made or should there even be an investment right. made. Right. Based and on its condition and its model, exactly. you Based can say, hey, it's worth $230 in Bingo. Morocco. Yes, exactly. Sell it there. Yeah, mm. Exactly. And you know what? It's okay to spend fifty dollars into refurbishing it or doing whatever, or you know, changing the glass of it or yeah. whatever the case may be. You know, there's demand. Yes, yeah. exactly. I mean, yeah, and you're making that call. And you know, most people, most businessmen, are willing to put in an investment if there is a value to be gained at the yep. end of the mm-hmm. cycle, right? So this is this is the best way to do mm-hmm. it. So this is a system that enables you to make these decisions uh, without a human having to make those static mm-hmm. decisions, mm-hmm. right? So. Um, so that's that's one of our products. The second product that we have is, uh, um, so we are we have a very data savvy company. We are a data science company. So we we have built what is called as a supply chain insight product. It's a it's a deep learning um, AI based data analytics product that allows you to do forecasting, real time auction value monitoring, mm. um, your basic bread and butter data analytics. You know, so it's all cloud based. It's easy to deploy. It's all on tap. It's SaaS product. Both mm. of these are SaaS products. So, mm. so literally, um, we so can. So one is a service to the other. Is that? Um, or one is. Yeah. Is so that still part of Phoenix? Yes. I know both you have are. Other both are. Got yeah. It. Both are part of Phoenix. Um, we typically lead with the supply chain inside product. So we go in and we would deploy uh, the data analytics product, and we would that makes it easy to show. Uh, value and business case right. to go in and deploy Midas. Right. and Because um, that's what people care about. They exactly. don't care about the how. Exactly. exactly. It's the what. Yeah, exactly. Right. right? Yeah. And and the the beauty of it is both are so- software as a service, uh, both are browser-based. There's, there's no significant hardware that is required. Easy to deploy, easy to manage, centrally located. So you could have 20 warehouses and you could deploy Midas in all 20 of them, all centrally managed, full rules-based engine. Um, so, you you know, you can have thousands of SKUs and it would still be able to do proper disposition based on that as well. Wow. So, um, so, yeah, I mean, we, we, found, uh, we, we found significant customers who like it, mm-hmm. um, significant in size. So, we work with Fortune 50s nice. out there. Where, now, where's Phoenix... Innovations is based where? In Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. Of course. In yeah. Alfreda. Where yeah, else would you have a company named Phoenix Innovations? So, uh, but you're doing <laughs> business globally, clearly, with Fortune 50s. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Outstanding. Uh, so, Midas was the name of the first product. What was the name of the second product? I missed Supply it. Chain Insight. Supply Chain Insight. Okay. Well, I hate to ask what else because there's so <laughs> much we could dive deeper in those two. Yeah. Um, so, we ha- also, so, last year we... A few years ago, we realized that the world is moving towards automation and automated systems. Labor is getting more and more expensive around the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you know, to compete with China, we really need to have a different answer. We cannot have labor as an answer. Mm. So automation uh, is one area that we started focusing on. Um, we started a company called Griffin Robotech. 
Now, Griffin Robotech is based out of India. Okay, I was about to say Griffin, Georgia, but no. No. Yeah. <laughs> not really. Someday. Yeah. Someday. Someday, yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, but Griffin is based out of India. Griffin focuses on inspection robotics. So, uh, yeah. so there's a lot of pick-and-place robotics. There's a lot of robotics, which is ASRS, which is automated storage and retrieval systems. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, bots that can move your racks around and do picking for you and things like that. Right. But we focused on inspection as a technology. We found a niche in that. Um, we are inspecting high-value items such as smartphones mm-hmm. and grading them. Got it. So in today's world, you would have a line of 40, 50 people sitting down looking at phones, and in 10 seconds, they grade a phone. Yeah. But guess what? If I grade a phone as B, I, I can be about 70% sure you're not going to grade it as B. Because your eyes look at it differently than right, mine right. do. The angle of the light plays a role. A lot yeah. of things play a role, in right? And if you think about it, the difference between a grade A and a grade B of a phone in a reseller market is probably about $70 on an average. <laughs> You're leaving so a lot what, of money yeah, on the table. Guess, you know? so guess what? They get graded more often. <laughs> Absolutely, bet, yeah. Right? yeah. Graded up as well, yeah, right? Yeah. And so what happens <laughs> yeah. is that the market has realized that and the market economy basically self-corrects itself. So, mm-hmm. so you actually have now grade Bs going off as grade As and then the person who's buying at the other end probably makes a mistake of buying it as a grade A first few times and then realizes, oh, I'm actually getting Bs. Yeah. So then he drops the price and it's an auction. So yeah. it kind of corrects itself, right? So and, and we're talking you know, over the course of hundreds of thousands of devices. That, that yes. $170 mistake in terms yeah. of valuation. Could That's big bucks. Big bucks. So yeah. It adds up very quickly. You know, I, what I also didn't realize, going back to something you shared, that I think was really relevant for this uh, segment of the conversation, is that demand of previous generation iPhones. Yeah. You know, uh, the, the iPhone 6 is the example used. I just I just moved from an iPhone 6, a shame, a, uh, a shame to say, a couple t- months ago. Yeah, but you took a big <laughs> leap. <laughs> you went to 11, 11 right? Pro. Yeah. Oh. He, I mean, you didn't he didn't mess went. around. Yeah, yeah, I went from like yeah. a 57 Chevy to, uh, you know, I don't know, a yeah. Honda, Honda Accord or something. But, um, Tesla. Yeah, Tesla. <laughs> Tesla, yeah, yeah. Um, but – I think a lot of folks may not understand that side of uh, smartphone devices, that side of the reverse, uh, just just the market, you yeah. know? Um, all right, so Griffin Robotech, all yep. about in the inspection yes. of these devices that get really good, accurate valuations, which uh, evidently can save business or make business. Millions of dollars. Lot. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And mm-hmm. so we, we and have expedite a, the process. Too. Yeah. Right, exactly. So we have a patent pending technology that Griffin produced. It's an it's an AI um, 3D imaging uh, using a 2D camera. Okay. So we can actually um, we can tell you the depth of the scratch based on a 2D image that we take. Wow. And hmm. It's it's pretty interesting tech. I mean, well, it seems like that would um, you're taking measures or adding measures to to get as objective as you can about exactly. the valuation. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Right, yeah. Right. And now we we did that, and then um, I was traveling uh, back and forth from India once, and I sat next to this guy um, who works at McLaren, and we got talking. He's a mm. CFO over there, and he said, "Hey." Would you talk to our engineers because they're trying to figure out how to understand and uh, do QA on the scratches on pistons for McLaren? Mm. Interesting. Wow. Serendipitous. Case. Yeah, so, exactly, right? <laughs> Whatever gets you closer to a very fast car. <laughs> exactly, right? right? Yeah. And, and then That's he tried to convince me to buy one, of which I have kind of resisted up to this point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Up to this point, being the well, operative wait, word. Yeah, yeah. wait for the 720S. Then, yeah, exactly. Then, then buy one. Yeah. yeah all right. I, I'm already lost. I'm already <laughs> lost. All right. So Those are beautiful. Yeah. There's one other business and venture yes. we may want to touch on. Yeah. So we have a third company as part of the group. It's uh, called Excalibur Infotech. It's, um, it's our in-house uh, product development company. Um, it's a software company. So rather than outsourcing this to other people, we outsource to our own company, and then we get Built all the work done. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. so Griffin and uh, Phoenix design the products, and then Excalibur builds it for 
both the companies and then uh, delivers it. Where is that located? Uh, so Excalibur is located here in Atlanta okay. and also in Pune, India. Okay. Yeah. So I have a company. We have a, we have our own internal. Yeah, yeah. Offshore development yes. in Pune as well. Oh, really? So, yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we should. Great town. Yeah, yeah we'll have exactly. to go visit yeah, together. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> we'll stay at your parents' place. I'm actually going on Wednesday <laughs> if you want to tag along. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can't make it that quick. <laughs> <Yeah>. All right. <laughs> All right, so thank you for walking us through kind of those three complementary uh, business models. Uh, and I can only imagine how you're, you're kind of leveraging the family of companies to work together uh, to, 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 to bring so more not value. Yet. Oh, okay, please. Yeah, I'm so sorry. So I have one more uh, small company. This is a young startup. It's a Where's my homework on this one there, Greg. It's well, I mean, he probably started <laughs> it while we were doing the show. <laughs> <laughs> Please. So uh, it's called Ricochet Motorcycles. So uh, blending in the passion to do uh, to ride motorcycles, and um, and you know working on them uh, in my own garage and stuff like that. So eventually, I got around to starting with, with a guy who's a young builder in India. He built one of the bikes for me. And um, I, I loved it so much. Uh, he came around and he asked me if I wanted to start a company. And I said, hell, why not? You know, I mean, we had some spare space at Griffin uh, factory. <laughs> really? And yeah, exactly. We put it all together. And uh, yeah, and so we're now building custom bikes. Wow. And uh, so it's, it's a new movement in India. The market is not very well developed. Mm. So, what kind of bike? Um, so we typically take a three three fifty or a five hundred bullet, okay, Enfield bullet, and then we customize it. Okay, you make it into choppers. Mm. We make it into cafe racers. Awesome. We nice. Do, uh, yeah, it's 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 fun. Tiny little yeah. crotch rockets. Are you doing? We haven't done those yet. Not yet. <laughs> no. I don't think the chassis lends itself well. No, to that, it does, does not. It? Yeah. No, no, it does yeah. not. Yeah. So I, I'm I'm hesitant to move on because you might say, "Hey, wait, there's more." No, let's just ask. Him. So <laughs> what's what company did you just start five minutes ago? I have not yet. Not yet. Okay, good. I think it's safe. Yes. Yeah. Yet. All right. So yeah. what is yeah. the keyword? Right. Yeah. So throw a curveball at you a little bit. Sure. But I think you can you can answer this in your sleep. Uh, as being as entrepreneurial as you are, lots of different ventures and, and passions and following up on your passions. And I love I love kind of like the, the, the strategic approach you've taken. Uh, the motorcycle venture, maybe not as much, but those first three companies, yeah. I, you can almost see how they can they can work, work together. together. Yeah, yeah. What, whether, whether for our audience members that are curious about being entrepreneurs, maybe they're in school or maybe they're early in industry or maybe they're in early stage companies, right? And they're in the trenches fighting blood, sweat, and tears. What's one piece of advice, Amit, that you would share um, you know, to get folks th- the breakthrough? Just don't give up. I just, you know, I, I've seen way too many people give up too early. Mm. And um, I think anything that has helped us be where we are is tenacity. Mm. We just will fight it. If you believe in your idea, you just cannot give up. Mm. So believe in yourself, believe in your idea. There will be a lot of people who will tell you it's not worth it, mm. it's too late, it's too early. I, I think listen done. to them. Yeah, yeah, it can be done. I, I can't tell you how many times people told me. So when I started the robotics company, my biggest customer, he pulled me aside and he was like, are you serious you want to do this? And I said, why do you ask? I mean, he said, well, you're a software guy. You've been doing software 25 years. What do you know about electronics and robots? And I said, well, I'm an electronics engineer. That should help. But yeah. That was, but that was a long time ago. But I, I think I, I think if you got an idea and, and you go after it pretty hard, you can make it happen. The best thing about it is building good, solid teams, empowering them, funding them. Mm. And, uh, and, you know, and then just doing good. That's yeah. it. I mean, you think people... People work hard when you when you give them respect. Mm. When you work closely with them, and you know when they see you not giving up as well. I mean, I we me and so all my leadership, we uh, we work shoulder to shoulder with all the engineers. We are all engineers, top to bottom. The entire company is full of engineers. Yeah. Uh, even our uh, even our VP of intellectual property. Uh, she's an engineer as well. Uh, I kid you not. I mean, she's 60, 
five years mm. old. Okay. Mm. And Just getting started. Yeah, if, well, uh, you have no idea. Man. <laughs> yeah. I'm so five years ago, she calls me up and she says, hey, would you write me a recommendation letter? I said, for what? And she says, well, I want to do master's. Okay. In electromechanical engineering. Uh, are you mad? You already have a <laughs> master's. <laughs> yeah, but I want to do another master's in electromechanical engineering. I said, why? Because it's free. I'm over 60 and it's free. Georgia State? Did she go? Uh, no, in Minnesota. In, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So so lots of schools are doing that. Yeah. That's and so interesting. It's, uh, it's amazing. And, and so I did write a reco and she got in. And uh, you know the most amazing thing is she gets to learn from all these kids and they get to have a free IP lawyer in their classroom. Yeah. Mm. As they are coming up with these new ideas. Yeah. They got free advice. She's helping them protect it. Yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, it's it's That's it's a match made in the heaven, you know. Yeah. So it's brilliant and it's just great people. Yeah. You got to love yeah. that kind of ambition. Mm. Exactly. Right. I love it. Yeah. All right, so we're going to kind of broaden back out. So we've kind of walked through uh, the different elements of the enterprise. Sure. Uh, I want to get you to weigh in on the global business environment, uh, the, the global end-to-end supply chain world. When, when you think about all the the ever-evolving world and environment we live in, right, what's a trend or issue or topic or two that you're really tracking more than others right now? I think the world is starting to look at risk from China a lot more seriously Mm. than they have been in the past. Um, I think President Trump's been talking about it for a while. I may not agree with all his policies, but I think I do agree with this one, that we are too slanted towards China for Mm. building all our things, and um, we need to take a step back and ask ourselves the question, hey, what if China were not to produce it? What would happen to us, Mm. right? I mean, so, Mm. I mean, look at coronavirus right now. Most Chinese factories are down, it's hitting us hard. Yeah. Um, and and if you think about it, a lot of um, medical supplies, non-pharma supplies, are coming out of China. Like mm-hmm. cotton swabs, bandages, and stuff like that. It's all gloves, coming out of China. Masks. Yeah, gloves, yep. masks, everything, right? So yep. all of that was being produced over there. And that supply chain is right now silent. It's dark, right? And so... Um, there's a massive impact. So I think people are starting to take a step back and mm-hmm. say, wait a minute, w- what has happened here and how do I protect myself from this? So we really need to start looking at this and and figure out what sort of opportunities it creates. And I feel that the tremendous opportunities will be in manufacturing around the world. I think there will be secondary and tertiary manufacturing zones that yep. should be created. Um, people are looking at India quite a bit at the moment. It's it's a more stable economy, more stable democracy mm-hmm. than China is. China is not really a democracy, but yeah, yeah. you know what I mean. <laughs> um, and I like you're a straight shooter. <laughs> I like that. I meet. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, no, 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 no. no. It's good. Sometimes blunt works, right? So, um, but there is. A, I think European Union with Brexit is a big challenge as well. Um, I think Poland offers tremendous opportunities for manufacturing mm. in the EU. Um, I think manufacturing will come back to US as well. I, I feel there are a lot of secondary areas in US which are hurting quite a bit mm. because um, they've been neglected. I think we've got a lot of, uh, um, lot of wealth concentrated in metros. But if you go into secondary and tier three cities in U.S., yeah, there's a lot less wealth and there's a lot of pain. Yes, and, and opportunity. Of, and there's a lot of opportunity. I mean, I think and good people. I mean, there's a lot of good workers out here. Right. So there's no reason why we, if we build um, companies in those areas, we can't, you know. So, so think about it. This, what kind of opportunities does this present to us, right? As supply chain people, it presents shipping opportunities mm. because goods have to go back and forth to these areas. Uh, it it affords us warehousing opportunities, handling opportunities. Mm. It offers us robotic uh, opportunities. People will be there doing things, so we will hire workers to actually assemble and put things together. So there will be manufacturing components that will be required. So so right. now you are getting the whole gamut, and, and hopefully... I, 
I, I really hope that the investment community, the private equity markets, support this going forward because I feel we really need to bring that back into the country. Well, yeah. in the Western Hemisphere, there's no way around it. Yeah. The largest, the largest generation in the history of the planet is exiting the workforce at yes. 10,000 per exactly. day. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And the only way to compete with masses of very cheap labor that yeah. China has is with robotics. Yeah. So between robotics and and the, uh, between that cost uh, structure in China and the reduction of population of yep. workforce in the U.S. and in, in the Western Hemisphere, then uh, we really have to expect that robotics is the way that we can compete. And it's a great lever. Right? Exactly. It's a great, not, not only to to diversify to secondary and tertiary markets for production to Southeast Asia and South America and, and the states um, for for secondary and tertiary uh, production of goods as a second source, maybe there's an opportunity to be yeah. a first source. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And robotics reduce plays a risk. big part in that. Yeah, reduce risk tremendously. Also, you know, it can act as an amazing procurement tool because yep. now you can negotiate better. Yep. You're not held hostage. That's right. You know, so... Yep. Think about and that. you've got a plan B if a disruption occurs in any one particular area. Mm -hmm. Companies yeah. have, some companies have actively managed the, against that kind of risk for decades. Right. Some for just a few years, and now I think many, many more will. Yes. Um, all right. So let's. I, I want to make sure as we start to kind of wind things down here. Um, how can folks? What's, what's the best place? Uh, I guess Phoenix Innovations URL. Maybe what's the best place to learn more? about every, all the incredible things you and your team are up to these days. So we've, I'll give you a couple of websites. Please. Um, the Phoenix Innovations website is pi, Papa India, 108.com. Yep. And uh, the Griffin uh, Robotech website is griffin, G-R-I-F-F-Y-N, dot I-O. Okay. And so we've got all our products listed out there. Um, we I didn't mention one of the products that Griffin's working on is in industrial IoT. So we've got an edge box, which is uh, industrial IoT, a artificial intelligence capable. We can run inferencing engines on that, deep learning engines on that. And um, and so that, and we have a cloud which monitors operational excellence dashboards. It has out of the box dashboard. So we would love to talk to people over here at the show uh, who have machines, because this can, easily and seamlessly integrate into their machines mm -hmm. and uh, give them immediate access to those machines from online wow. you know, and give them visibility. So so we are slowly, I mean, we are, a, we are a three and a half year old group at this point in time. We are slowly stitching these things together. Our, our intent is, uh, is, is, um, is that we, we should be able to give uh, an end-to-end -end supply chain solution to a company, to our customers here in the next five to seven years. Wow. Yeah. So that's an impressive and ambitious, <laughs> optimistic, <laughs> yes. right? That's good. I, I mean, I think. You got to believe, right? Well, look, the technology exists. Yes. What we need is people like you who can, who can adapt it. Yeah. And then people who will adopt it. Put it together to the use case. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And mm. that's, I think the, the interesting thing is um, there's a lot of appetite to bring in new technology i see a lot of enthusiasm there's a there's a lot of the, and uh, the 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 challenge sometimes is um, is the markets do not necessarily always reward people who take those challenges especially first movers yeah, yeah especially yeah. the first movers so it, uh, you just have to hang on yeah and you know For that's where we life. started right yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> even if you today's stock market is a <laughs> Whether you're you going 145 on a mo motorcycle or if you're a first mover in one of these spaces. Or in a free on fall tight. on a dow, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, oh, my gosh. So do you um, – so you strike me as someone that folks would love to put an audience in front of you. And, and, and do you do many keynotes or panels? I have not, actually. You, you got to. I, I don't know if you, you – know, so we talk to all kinds of folks. We, we publish our 300th episode uh, well, about the time this, this thing hits, uh, a month or so ago. And you keep it real. Not to be cliche or cheesy, but really, thank you. You call it like you see it. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, 
Uh, we've seen a variety of CEOs come on the show. We've had we've had a great two back to back ones. One yeah. was very down to earth, very genuine, very um, uh, you know, the, the servant leadership thing was very component, uh, very uh, inherent in his style. And then to see another business leader that really make no bones about it, this is this is what's taking place. I mean, we need more of that. I think. Well, yeah. I think to be to be the kind of leader that that you are, you have to be that matter of fact. You don't have time to mince words. You have yeah. you have to recognize even if you're wrong, you have to recognize what you believe and you right. have to go with what you believe, right? Yeah, I mean, that's that how you, that's the only way you can do there's it. There's nothing wrong in accepting you're wrong. Yeah. Right? I mean, not everybody can be right all the time. So yeah. why not be a little bit humble about it, right? Mm. Keeps you grounded. Yeah. Yes. Right? You learn a even lot at 145 more. an hour, right? Yeah. <laughs> you would learn a whole lot at that speed. Yeah. But you learn a lot more when yeah. you're wrong than you do when you're right. Absolutely, man. So I want to, I want to, um, but I want to be right more times than yeah. I am. Darn wrong. skippy. Yeah. Yes, it's okay to be wrong, but it shouldn't be the goal. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we've already established where folks can learn more about um, uh, Phoenix Innovations and uh, Griffin Robotech, right? Yes. Um, one last question. Sure. Because uh, especially when you think of the, um, the, the organizations, plural, that you're building out. Um, speak to our audience. What's what's one thing, and, and you put this a lot of times. I think last time I heard you ask this question, Greg, you said, if I'm walking down the hallway in my business, yep. and in my brain I'm thinking about the problems I'm having other than the curse words, what what triggers the, the need in me to reach out to a meet? What is that? What's a, a Give us a scenario where you're like, hey, we can help. If you're experiencing ABC, reach out. We can help. So if you're experiencing um, data issues in your in your business, if you're experiencing visibility issues in your business, or if you're if you just plain old want to sit down and solution um, solution your problems, reach out to us. I know that sounds vague and cheesy, but wouldn't we, go with cheesy, <laughs> 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 but we, but we do. I mean, uh, just bluntly speaking. Sorry about that, but uh, no, but, no, but you know, I mean, we we do a lot of innovation as part of what we do, and I don't say that lightly. We got few patents in the in the working at the moment. Um, we do a lot of new products. Uh, this is my I I didn't mention this, but I built and I sold my last company in 2016 so i was one of the early guys that built diagnostic software for smartphones when nobody was doing that and uh, in 2016 a p acquired it and i exited that and then i started this group so uh, it's i think if innovation is what you guys if the customers want then yeah they can give us a call pi108.com yeah i think if you're leaving if you feel like you're leaving money on the table Yes. With returned goods? Yeah. Give them a call. Perfect. PI108.com and Griffin.io. And, again, I'm going to say. I diagnose superpowers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's my superpower. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Amit Mahajan coming to a keynote near you. is my. We should make sure that that happens. It should. You know we can make that happen. Yes. It, right. it needs to happen. <laughs> Thank you. Really have enjoyed our conversation. Uh, Thanks, sit Scott. tight for just a second. We've been talking with Amit Mahajan, founder and CEO of Phoenix Innovations, Griffin Robotech, Excalibur Infotech, and Ricochet Motors- Motorcycles. Motorcycles. Man, what a collection. Good stuff. Really enjoyed it. Greg, that wraps up in, uh, a, a very solid, exceptional day one here yeah. at Modex. Yeah, I mean, it's just, I think it's just a great example of the kind of skills and gifts, innovation and ambition that we're seeing here. Yeah. Right? You, know, you know what I'm most thankful about through these co- earlier conversations? What's that? <laughs> That the huge device over your right shoulder <laughs> never came through the back of our studio. I keep on, I keep on thinking the same thing's going to happen. It feels like a circus ride is going on every once in a while when they start uh, that thing winding and wrapping pals. It, but I mean, tell what, for wrapping the saran wrap, yes. that's way over engineered. Okay? That's right. It so feels like it, doesn't it? <laughs> and, but it's fast. It's super fast. Oh, yeah. That's right. We got a good guy, the, the fine folks from Wolf Wolf Tech over yeah, there. Yannick, who is uh, <laughs> working over there, he said, "Look, if it bothers you, we'll shut it down." I'm thinking we're good. There were a couple times when I th- <laughs> thought I felt it brush my shoulder, <laughs> but well, uh, uh, really enjoyed our conversation. Uh, Thanks, to our Scott. audience, uh, be sure to check out yeah. our events webinar tabs at Supply Chain Now. 
uh, radio dot com a variety of things if you like what you heard here with a meet uh, you're going to love checking out our library of interviews some of our upcoming events you name it we've got some great yeah. events teed up with eft reuters events the automotive industry action group the georgia logistics summit and much much more point a point a. Okay. Well, we're, are we out ahead of our skis there we can say All we right. have an event with we point love a. well we love collaborating with the fine folks at point a the innovation the Supply Chain Innovation Center uh, yeah. right here yeah. in Supply Chain City. Um, you can learn all about all of that stuff at SupplyChainNowRadio.com. If, if there's something that you do not see that we've talked about, shoot us a note to Amanda at SupplyChainNowRadio.com. Big thanks to our guest here today on this latest episode coming to you live from Modex here in Supply Chain City. Amit Mahajan, founder and CEO of Phoenix Innovations, Griffin Robotech, Excalibur Infotech, Ricochet. Motorcycles. Motorcycles. Uh, Be sure to check out other upcoming events, uh, past interviews, other resources at SupplyChainRadio.com. Find us and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from, including YouTube. And on behalf of the entire team here, Scott Luton, wishing you a wonderful week ahead. We will see you next time on Supply Chain Radio. Thanks, everybody.